Okay, let's go, let's go ahead and get started. Sorry, it took me a minute to figure out how to get this thing working. Um, I think uh, uh, one of my favorite things to do when I teach a course is complain about how everything that's wrong with the course is due, of course, to the my laptop uh, and not to my own personal failings. Um, uh, today, what I would like to do is uh, conclude our discussion of quantum kinematics. Uh, that is to say, our discussion of uh, this description of the space of states and of observables in quantum mechanics. So just, uh, yes? Sorry, can I ask a question just at the beginning? Sure. Uh, are there assignments you posted just to clarify? Yeah, I made a mistake. Connection? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, it's for those of you who noted, uh, noticed, um, when I handed out the problem set last week, I gave you two weeks uh, in some sort of moral failing. I decided it would be nice to give you an extra week on the first problem set. Um, but then I forgot that I had been nice, and I started making another problem set to hand out today. And I went as far as posting it on the web page before someone reminded me that, uh, uh, that in fact, uh, you didn't have a problem set due today. So in the future, um, I, of course, won't give uh, people an extra week to do the problem set. Um, but uh, for this year, um, yes. So yeah, ignore any uh, second problem sets that have been posted on the web page. Um, although, uh, you should always feel free to do it if you want to. Um, I'm not, I'm, you know, uh, but you don't need to. It's not going to be due next week. Uh, it will be due the week after. But I might add one or two more problems. Okay. So uh, don't worry. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, in fact, uh, I will certainly add at least one problem. Okay, good. Uh, any other uh, administrative uh, technical questions, something like that? I'm also going to schedule some office hours for the TAs. Um, somehow, there was some kerfluffle and the TAs were all shuffled around, and so the uh, TAs for this course have only now finally stabilized. Um, but they're in good condition, they're ready to work, and so I'm going to schedule uh, some sort of office hours for them, uh, for you. Okay. Any other questions of an administrative nature? Uh, good. Would, why don't you mind grab closing that door? Thank you. Okay, um, so just to remind you, um, in uh, quantum mechanics, states, physical states of a system are represented by kets in a Hilbert space that uh, I will often denote script H, uh, possibly with some subscript if I wish to denote uh, multiple different Hilbert spaces. <coughs> and operators, uh, sorry, observables, are represented by uh, linear operators on this Hilbert space um, and by special sorts of linear operators namely by Hermitian operators. And the outcome of an observation of an observable is one of the eigenvalues of this observable. And the probability of observing a particular eigenvalue is proportional to the absolute value square of the overlap between the state that represents uh, your, the physical state of the system and the eigenvector, the corresponding eigenvector of this uh, Hermitian observable. And one of the uh, fundamental uh, properties of quantum mechanics, which we began uh, discussing last time, is the uncertainty relation which is the statement that the variance of some observable A and the variance of some other observable B are bounded below by the expectation value of their commutator. So um, where here, of course, I remind you that the variance, the expectation value of delta A squared is the expectation value of the square of the difference between the observable A and its expected value in a given state. So here, the expectation value of A is just a shorthand 
for the matrix element of A in the state which we are considering. And as we verified last time, according to the uh, third postulate of quantum mechanics about the outcomes of observations, uh, this is indeed the normal expectation value of some variable uh, as uh, we have already encountered it in statistical mechanics, for example, or in probability theory. Now, um, I just want to uh, follow up our discussion last time but with a few comments about this um, uh, uncertainty relation. So the first thing that I should emphasize is that if two observables are compatible, namely if their commutator vanishes, then as we reminded ourselves last time, it's possible to simultaneously diagonalize uh, their, the eigenstates of these observables. And in particular, it's possible to find a basis for your Hilbert space where all of the basis states are simultaneously eigenvalues of those two operators. And in that basis, both of those operators will have definite <coughs> values, meaning that the outcome of an observation of one of those uh, observables will have a definite answer with probability one. And in that case, the variance of uh, both of these observables would be equal to zero. And indeed, you can see that this is allowed by this formula because the, in that case, where both of the operators commute, the right-hand side of this formula would be equal to zero. What's more interesting, however, are incompatible observables, such as position and momentum. So, for example, if we remember that position and momenta don't commute, then this implies uh, that in any possible state, the variance in x times the variance in p has some absolute lower bound, which is of order h bar squared. One thing that's important to emphasize, however, is that it's only in special cases where the commutator between two operators is a constant rather than another operator where the right-hand side of this equation will be independent of the state under consideration. If we consider more complicated types of observables whose commutator is not constant, but rather is another observable, let's say the observables x squared and p, whose commutator is proportional to x rather than is proportional to a constant, then the right-hand side of this equation would be dependent on the state that you're considering. The right-hand side would be basically the expectation value of x squared. And this would be uh, some sort of more interesting uh, version of the uncertainty principle, one which would depend both in the right-hand side and the left-hand side on the state under consideration. So let me, however, continue for a minute by thinking about this simple case where I have x and p whose commutator is a constant. And I just want to make one more uh, set of comments, which is that given this uncertainty relation between x and p, there is now a special class of states in the Hilbert space which we can consider, namely those states which saturate this inequality. And a state which does so, so namely a state for which this inequality is an equality, has a special name, uh, the name is not very surprising. Um, the special name for such states would be a uh, minimum uncertainty state. How many people have seen minimum uncertainty states? So um, it's something, so in fact, you all should have raised your hand because you have all seen minimum uncertainty states. Uh, you may not have called them such. So, um, for example, a simple example of a minimum uncertainty state would be a Gaussian. So, for example, if we are considering a particle moving in one dimension, then a wave function, which is a Gaussian, say the exponential of x squared over 2d squared, of course, times some normalization constant out front, if we wish to unit normalize our wave functions, will be a minimum uncertainty state. Okay. We could check that um, very quickly 
Uh, shall we check that? Shall we prove that? Or would you guys like to prove it to yourselves uh, tonight as you lull yourselves to sleep? Do you want me to check that for you? No. Yes, raise your hand if you'd like me to check that. This is okay. a few people. How about this? Let's think of, let's do a slightly more complicated example. So here's a little trick question for all of you. Um, given the fact that this is a minimum uncertainty state, can you guess another minimum uncertainty state? Someone guess another minimum uncertainty state. Yes. Oh, thank you. Of course. Thank you. Otherwise, this would not be a normalizable state. Thank you. Uh, Gaussian e to the minus x squared. Very good. Gold star for you. Can anyone else uh, guess a, uh, yes. No. Can anyone else guess another minimum uncertainty state? I'll give you a hint. A minimum uncertainty state, so such states are as close as one can get to uh, classical states <coughs> in quantum mechanics. So, for example, this state here is a very good approximation to uh, a particle which is sitting at x equals zero because the wave function is centered in some Gaussian wave packet around x equals zero. Okay. So that was a little hint. Can anyone now, I'm not going to go on until someone answers this question, guess for me another uh, minimum uncertainty state? No. Well, technically, yes. Okay. The delta function is given by the d going to uh, zero limit of this Gaussian. Uh, d is describing the width of the wave packet. So you could take it very small and then... Uh, yeah, okay, so that's true, but that's kind of already on this example. Yes? You could replace x by x minus a. Certainly you could replace x by x minus a to get a Gaussian wave packet <laughs> centered somewhere else. Excellent. That's one possible answer to this question. What's another one? Go, green hair. Um, a function which is its own Fourier transform. Um, good, yes. Uh, Well, a Gaussian is its own Fourier yeah, transform. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, let me give you a hint. Particles uh, can have, pos this is a classical, this is a minimum uncertainty state, which describes a particle uh, that looks like it's sitting at the origin x equals zero. What other possible classical motions could a particle have? Yes. Uh, Yes. Okay. That's that's essentially right. Okay. Um, you can give this part. You can try and give this uh, quantum uh, particle that's very close to a classical one some sort of momentum. So, for example, you could add plus i k x here, which is essentially what you were saying. Okay. Uh, not. It's close to what you were saying. Okay. So, for example, this will be an example of a wave packet. Um, which is a very good approximation to something with a definite position and a definite velocity. Of course, it's not completely definite uh, because of quantum mechanics, but it saturates the uncertainty relation. And so it's these family of states which in the limit where h bar is going to zero, these will go over to classical states. In trying to understand quantum mechanics, a great way of thinking, organizing your thinking is trying to identify uh, those quantities which can be identified with classical quantities in the semi-classical, uh, which is to say small h bar limit. And so, for example, these states are ones that would be good approximations to classical states under some circumstances when h bar goes to zero. Can anyone think of another? Uh, okay. There are other examples of minimum uncertainty states. Uh, I'll give you a hint. X and P must be, complete, must be treated completely democratically. Okay. There's in classical physics, there's a canonical transformation that interchanges X and P. So, uh, yes? Uh, actually, no. The states of the harmonic oscillator are not minimum uncertainty states. Um, with the exception of the ground state, which, of course, is a Gaussian. And indeed, however, 
Um, when we study the states of the harmonic oscillator, we will describe uh, in great detail a basis of states for the harmonic oscillator, which are minimum uncertainty states, which are essentially generalizations of this. And they go under the name of coherent states. Um, again, like, so the eigen, let's, let's, let's be a little more specific. The energy eigenstates of the uh, hydrogen atom or of the harmonic oscillator um, will, uh, in general, not be minimum uncertainty states. Uh, so uh, we're used to thinking about quantum mechanics. You know, we've been taught to think about quantum mechanics in terms of energy eigenstates. But that's not always the most useful thing to do. Because if you want a description which goes over in a smooth way to the, in the classical limit where h bar goes to zero, it's very often useful to use uh, these minimum uncertainty states or these coherent states. And when we discuss uh, the harmonic oscillator in more detail, uh, that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. Um, uh, so for example, um, I could use these states here as a set of basis states for the harmonic oscillator. Uh, instead of the um, basis states that you're used to, um, namely the energy eigenstates. And these would be states that would be labeled by two parameters. So, for example, the width of the state and the momentum of the state. And, in fact, these form a perfectly good basis for the Hilbert space of uh, states for the harmonic oscillator. Okay. And uh, it's often a very, it's a very uh, uh, interesting and different way of thinking about a harmonic oscillator when you write it in terms of this basis. And it actually has all these sorts of useful physical uh, applications. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, I didn't get a chance to uh, make my final statement, which is that I can think of at least one other family of uh, wave functions, which are minimum uncertainty wave functions, if I just remember that X and P have to be treated completely democratically, which means that a, uh, I could also have wave functions uh, in position space, which are Gaussians of this form. Um, I guess those would be, okay, never mind. Uh, we'll get to that in a little more detail uh, when we study coherent states. Okay. Any questions on uncertainty relations, observables, and so forth? I want to dive now at least very briefly into the topic of um, symmetries in quantum mechanics. Um, this is something that's going to occupy a great deal of our time later in the course. But right now I just want to introduce a few more um, uh, basic uh, bits of uh, language and a few definitions regarding uh, certain types of operators in quantum mechanics. So in particular, a unitary operator is a linear operator which obeys u times u dagger is equal to 1 where u dagger is the Hermitian conjugate, otherwise uh, known as the statement that u dagger is u inverse. And as uh, you either know or can convince yourselves of easily, if u times u dagger is equal to 1, then so is u dagger times u. Why are unitary operators useful? Unitary operators are useful because they preserve the inner product structure of the Hilbert space. In particular, if you think about a unitary operator as a linear map, which takes a state alpha to the state u times alpha, and likewise, um, it will take the state beta, uh, it will take a ket beta to beta times u dagger, that's just the definition of the Hermitian conjugate, then it will take the inner product between the two, to itself. So transformations in quantum mechanics, which preserve the inner product, are uh, very useful. They will arise when we consider uh, all sorts of symmetry operations in quantum mechanics. And in general, they will usually be described by linear operators. So let me now just remind you of a few facts about linear operators. 
So first of all, linear operators are essentially the quantum mechanical analog of the orthonormal uh, rotation matrices that you may have encountered in your linear algebra class. And in particular, they're very useful when you want to describe changes of basis in quantum mechanics. So given two sets of basis kets, in of a, and let's call them orthonormal basis kets, uh, let's say ANs and BNs normalized in the usual way so that their inner products are ones or zeros, then that implies that there exists a unitary transformation which takes one of these sets of bases to the other. And uh, if this is not clear, then I challenge you uh, to construct this unitary operator. I'll give you a hint. It's constructed in terms of the exterior product uh, uh, operators that we defined last class. And as a corollary to this statement, if we have some set of basis states, which form an orthonormal basis, if I can spell orthonormal, ortho, I don't know what letter that is. Sorry, my handwriting is not very good. If you have some orthonormal basis, then you can always act on it with some unitary operator to obtain another orthonormal basis. Unitary operators are the things that we use to go from one basis to another if we wish to preserve the inner product structure, and in particular, if we wish to take one orthonormal basis to another. So in particular, you should think of it as a complex version of a rotation matrix. So... Two Hermitian operators, A and B, which are related by uh, the formula A is U dagger B A, are said to be unitarily related. And the process of multiplying, oh, I'm sorry, that should be a U there, of course. The process of multiplying a uh, operator by U dagger on the left and U on the right is known as a similarity transform. Or simply as conjugation by the operator U. And as a, uh, fa a fact that is easy enough uh, to uh, prove, and I invite you to prove it to yourselves, is that these two operators, A and B, which are related in this way, have the same spectrum. I.e., they have the same eigenvalues. We often define the trace of an operator to be uh, the sum over n, where n labels some set of basis elements for your Hilbert space of the expectation value of A in the state Bn, where this is some sort of complete basis, And this trace is invariant 
under unitary transformation or under uh, similarity transformation, by by a unitary operator. And so when discussing quantities in quantum mechanics that are independent of the basis that we use, we'll very often find it convenient to express them in terms of traces. So if I hand you just an operator in a given basis, the matrix elements of an operator say, then those matrix elements will depend on what basis you're choosing to describe the operator. But, of course, actual physics shouldn't depend on what basis you choose to describe the space of states of a system. And so that means that it's very often useful to write things in a form where it's manifest that they're independent of the choice of basis. And writing things in terms of traces is a very convenient way of doing so. That's really why traces appear all over the place in mathematics and physics. Is there are quantities that are independent, invariant under conjugation, so don't depend on the choice of basis that we use to describe these matrices. Questions about unitary operators? Just as we can define a unitary operator, one can also define a anti-unitary operator. So an anti-unitary operator Let's not call it U, uh, let's call it theta, is an antilinear operator rather than a linear operator. So again, uh, an antilinear operator will take some state alpha to some state theta times alpha, and likewise it will take some cat beta to some other cat beta times theta dagger. So let's call these alpha tilde and beta tilde. And whereas an unitary operator is defined to leave the inner product unchanged, an anti-unitary operator is defined in such a way that it complex conjugates the inner product so that it takes the inner product to the complex conjugate of itself. Sorry, I should say. When we transform the states by this anti-unitary operator. So if we think of the example of the antilinear operator that we discussed last class, namely the complex conjugation by wave functions, you can see that if you complex conjugate two wave functions, then you'll also <coughs> complex conjugate their inner product. You'll also complex conjugate their overlap. So complex conjugation would be an example of an anti-unitary operator. And uh, when we discuss symmetries in quantum <laughs> mechanics, we will find that there are certain symmetries that are described by anti-unitary operators rather than by unitary operators. So um, just a word about symmetries. So it's worth, um, so we're going to spend a great deal of this course um, uh, discussing symmetries in quantum mechanics, but I just want to uh, mention one word about them and their relationship to uh, unitary and anti-unitary operators. So classically, a symmetry is a transformation of the dynamical variables say QI that leaves the Lagrangian, or let's say the equations of motion, unchanged. Say if you have a rotationally invariant system, 
then a change in the axes that we, a rotation of the axes that we use to describe the coordinates of the parts of our system will be, uh, will leave the equations of motion unchanged. Or if we wish to say it a little more uh, formally, it is a canonical transformation of our phase space variables which leaves the functional form of Hamilton's equations unchanged. Do you guys all remember what a canonical transformation is and what Hamilton's equations are? Those are things that you should have learned in your classical mechanics class. Do you feel comfortable with those words? Does that sentence that I have said confuse and terrify you? A canonical transformation is a change of variables uh, on phase space which preserves the fundamental uh, commu commutation relation or the fundamental Poisson bracket. So uh, if we have some phase space variables, qi and pj, which I use to describe the position and momenta, for example, of our system, then you could try and define some new position, qi, pj, where I'm now denoting them by capital letters, which are functions of the little qis and little pjs. And then this would be some change of variables that we're using to describe the kinematics, the space of states of our system. And it's called the canonical transformation if the Poisson bracket of the big qis and big qis is delta ij, just as it was for the little QIs and little PIs. Okay. So the simple example of a canonical transformation will be the transformation that takes X to P and P to minus X. And canonical transformations are the most fundamental description of the possible symmetries or the possible changes of variables you can make in uh, classical mechanics. And a canonical transformation is a symmetry if it leaves the form of the equations of motion unchanged. So remember that the equations of motion in classical mechanics say that qi is dh by dpi and pi is minus dh by dqi. So those are Hamilton's equations. And if those are left unchanged by this change of variables, which is a canonical transformation, then we have a symmetry. Unitary transformations are the quantum mechanical analogs of ca canonical transformations. And in quantum mechanics, a symmetry is a unitary operator or possibly um, an anti-unitary operator. So let me write it as a possibly unitary or anti-unitary operator. which commutes with the Hamiltonian. Now, I haven't, this is uh, quantum kinematics, not quantum dynamics. Quantum dynamics will start probably by the end of the lecture today. So I haven't talked to you about the equations of motion or Hamilton's uh, equations. Uh, but when we get to that, we'll see why it is that something which commutes with the Hamiltonian will leave the quantum version of the equations of motion unchanged. Okay. So this completes the uh, basic uh, 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 review of uh, quantum kinematics that I wanted to go through. Uh, maybe I should pause here and see if there are any questions. Has any, have you guys, you guys have not seen anti-unitary operators before, I assume. Um, 
we'll get we'll burn that bridge when we come to it. Any questions? Any comments? Any thoughts? Any uh, feelings you want to share with the group? No. Okay. Um, so what I now want to do is proceed to discuss quantum dynamics. But before I do, I would like to spend at least a few minutes describing to you uh, something which I think is really often not emphasized in uh, undergraduate uh, courses on quantum mechanics, uh, which is what exactly do we mean when we say that we quantize a system and uh, why it's such a mysterious and uh, poorly understood subject. So I would like to spend just a few minutes uh, discussing a couple uh, more advanced aspects of uh, what people usually call the problem of quantization. Okay. So let me just remind you, as we have already uh, discussed, that in classical physics, the space of states of a classical system is a phase space. made up of some momenta and conjugate uh, dynamical variables. And observables are functions of these phase space variables. So A of QI and PI. And when we quantize the system, that is to say, when we try and write down the quantum mechanical description of a given classical system, what we are doing is we are seeking to find a Hilbert space and some operators, A, that act on the Hilbert space such that the canonical Poisson bracket is promoted to the fundamental commutation relation between the position and angular momentum variables. So uh, schematically, quantization is the procedure by which uh, Poisson brackets are promoted to commutators according to the rule, oh, sorry about that, by which the commutator between two variables is equal to, uh, sorry, I, I drew a curly bracket there. That, of course, should be a commutator. is equal to 1 over i h bar times the corresponding Poisson bracket. However, uh, this procedure is not unique. And indeed, uh, this schematic rule that a quantum commutator is 1 over i h bar times the Poisson bracket is in fact uh, incomplete. And indeed, it's incorrect. So I'll put it in quotes here. So to see that this procedure is not unique, let's uh, imagine the following. So remember that one can always choose different phase space variables. Let's call them capital QI and capital PJ, which are related to little QI and little PJ by some canonical transformation. And in classical mechanics, the little q and p and the big q and p are equally good variables to describe the space of states of the system. This is just the statement that the physics that we're studying shouldn't depend on whatever variables I use to parameterize the dynamics of the system. 
If I want to study the motion of a pendulum, then I could study the motion by parameterizing it in terms of the height of the pendulum in the vertical direction. Or I could parameterize the motion of the pendulum in terms of the position of the pendulum in a horizontal direction. Or I could parameterize it in terms of some angle relative of the pendulum relative to the virtual axis, re relative to the vertical axis. These are three different ways of parameterizing the motion of the pendulum. And in classical physics, these are all equivalent. And that equivalence is encapsulated in the idea that the physics should be invariant under canonical transformations. And so the question then is, given our quantization scheme, where we promote the little q's and little p's to operators such that they preserve this fundamental commutation relation, does this take, so does our quantization scheme uh, respect the fact that big QI and big PJ also obey the fundamental commutation relation? So does this take this into some set of quantum operators whose Poisson bracket is I H bar times delta I J? You know, if you quantize a pendulum by first just thinking about the classical variables where you think about the dynamical variable as the vertical position of the pendulum, and then you quantize that and you get some fundamental commutation relation between the vertical position and vertical momentum of the pendulum, are you guaranteed to, in that quantization scheme, also get a system where the horizontal position of the pendulum and the horizontal momentum obey the same uh, Poisson bracket, obey the same canonical relation? And the answer, in general, is no. Different choices of dynamical variables can lead to different quantization schemes. And in general, when you choose which canonical variables, which dynamical variables to promote to canonical operators that obey this fundamental commutation relation, you're making a choice which is not present in classical physics. So the answers that you get in quantum mechanics will in principle depend on this choice. Question? Should we, uh, square brackets? Square brackets. Yeah, sorry about that, of course. Thank you. In general, what happens let's say that we have classical operators sorry, classical observables A and B whose Poisson bracket is a third uh, classical observable C, then in quantum mechanics, the best that we can do is to find observables, that is to say operators, such that the Poisson bracket, sorry, such that the commutator of the corresponding operators is given by I H bar times their Poisson bracket plus corrections of order H bar squared. <coughs> so for a general uh, dynamical system that we wish to quantize, these terms are inevitable.
So, whereas it's naively tempting to uh, call quantization the process by which classical commutator, classical Poisson brackets are promoted to quantum commutators, that is not correct. That is only correct in some sort of semi-classical approximation where you ignore uh, higher order in h-bar effects. And so the problem of quantization is to ask, is to determine these higher order terms. And unfortunately, in general, these higher order terms are not uniquely determined. Or to say it a different way, when we talk about a classical dynamical system, we're specifying certain data. We're specifying uh, some phase space. We're specifying a Hamiltonian. And uh, the question is whether that data is enough to uniquely determine a quantum mechanical system. The answer is no. So, um, For simple quantum systems, such as those uh, that we will consider in this class, these order h bar squared terms can be determined uniquely. So for the sorts of systems that we'll consider in this class, it's possible, in fact, to define a unique quantization scheme which will allow us to uniquely determine these order h bar squared terms. So we won't confront the problem of quantization in this course. But it is a problem. Uh, it's, the, that, it's, the, it's that lump under the rug that everybody's trying to ignore, um, which is that uh, in quantum mechanics, sometimes you just need to specify additional data that is not present in a classical system in order to uniquely define the dynamics. So what I'd now like to do is uh, just give you um, a brief uh, example of how these order of what these order h bar squared terms look like. Uh, in fact, you've seen them before. I know you have, um, but you may not have identified. You may not have realized just how strange and mysterious they are. But before I do so, let me pause and see if there are any questions. Yes. Um, is that where this problem comes from, from the fact that there is data that we're missing, or are there other underlying reasons why? Well, it's really that there's data that's missing. When we describe a classical dynamical system, uh, in general, for certain classical dynamical systems, there is a, a unique quantization scheme, and so that data is sufficient. But for other uh, systems, which we will not consider in this class, but which are physically very important, uh, the quantization scheme uh, is not uniquely determined. Uh, you know, one famous example is Hawking radiation. Okay, the fact that black holes give off quantum mechanical radiation is something that is uh, follows from the fact that the quantization scheme is not unique. And in general, what one has to do is one has to find some other physical principle that allows you to determine the correct quantization scheme. There was a question. Well, when you say O h bar squared, do you mean when divided by h bar squared, the operators are bounded? That's that's what I'm. That's precisely what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. You know, as usual, I am not going to dwell on mathematical <coughs> details. And uh, but yes, when I mean order h bar squared, I mean some operator whose eigenvalues are bounded in some nice way when we divide it by h bar squared. Um, I'll give you an example, several, a couple examples of such terms uh, in just a minute. Yes, question. Uh, I'm just curious as to what exactly a, a quantum, a, a quantization scheme is. Is it just a transfer? Of a what, what do I mean when I say a quantization scheme? Yeah. Well, um, a quantization scheme is some method by which you replace classical, a classical phase space by some quantum Hilbert space. 
and classical observables by quantum mechanical operators. So it's some set of rules. Okay. And um, you've learned, you know, what you have, what you have not learned um, in your quantum classes is the general definition of such a scheme. Um, and the reason why you have not learned the general definition of how you quantize an arbitrary classical system is that there is no general definition of how you quantize an arbitrary classical system. Okay, that is the point which I'm trying, which I want to try and emphasize, which is that there's a reason why uh, we don't begin quantum mechanics classes on day one by saying this is the definition of how you quantize any classical system because no such definition exists. What does exist is a scheme for quantizing any classical system with a bit of extra data. Okay. And it turns out for simple problems like the hydrogen atom or like a particle moving on a line, uh, there is that enough extra data that we know how to uniquely quantize it. And in fact, there's a whole field of mathematical physics called uh, geometric quantization, uh, which is involved with the attempt to sort of systematize this procedure. Uh, that's not something that I want to dwell on in this class. But I just want to, uh, you know, um, I just want to make sure that you guys uh, understand uh, that quantum mechanics is a deeply confusing subject. Uh, in addition to all of the normal everyday confusions about what the hell a wave function means and what the collapse of it means and all of that stuff, the fact that we as physicists, as a species, uh, don't understand quantum mechanics uh, in some basic way. Question. Uh, why do we quantize classical systems? Uh, that's a good question. We shouldn't quantize classical systems because classical physics is not the correct description of nature. What we should do is we should take the classical limits of quantum systems. So, of course, your answer, is, your question is, is really the right one. The right, the point is not that um, we should spend all of our time trying to quantize classical systems. The point is that we should identify the correct Hamiltonian of nature and take its classical limit uh, in order to understand its effects. But unfortunately, um, that is not the way that physics is done in practice. Uh, in practice, you might, you know, the way that quantum mechanics was developed and the way that you might try and use quantum mechanics in your lives is to start with a classical system and try and find the corresponding quantum mechanical system. Um, and so it is in that procedure where this problem arises. But of course you're correct that the correct way to proceed from some uh, ground up point of view is to try and take classical limits of quantum systems. And you could say that this problem arises only when we try and uh, do things uh, backwards and take the quantum limit of a classical system, which is something that, that is not completely unique. Yes, question. Uh, all each bar squared, that's stronger than saying O of one because H bar squared is a constant. I mean order h bar squared, uh, what do I mean? I mean in the limit where h bar... So you could treat it as a variable? Uh, treating it as a variable, you know. Uh, uh, it only makes sense for me to talk, distinguish between order h bar and order h bar squared terms if I imagine that h bar is continuous and I can, and, and I can take a limit where h bar is small and divide these terms into different sets. So implicitly when I talk about quantizing a classical system, that only makes sense if I have a descript if I'm working in a regime where quantum effects are small. You know. For example, a spin one half system is a system which really has no classical counterpart. Um, there's a reason why you don't learn about it in freshman physics, which is that there's no such thing as a spin one half particle. Well, I'm being a little glib, but there's a, 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 there's a, a a sense in which there's no such thing as a spin one half particle in classical physics. And so that's not a quantum Hilbert space that we construct this way by quantizing a classical system, uh, although one could if one wanted to, actually. Um, instead, you just present, you just start out with some general set of symmetry principles, uh, and then you try and identify possible Hilbert spaces that are consistent with those symmetry principles. Okay. That's how you really construct a spin one half system. That's probably not how you constructed it. Uh, in your your initial quantum class, but that's how we will construct it later on in this class. Okay. Other uh, questions, comments? Yes. Um, will it become clear from the example that you're doing why this is the best we can do, or is there another thing? Yes, it will become clear from the example and from the problem set, which is not due today. Okay. 
Let me give a very simple example. Okay. This is an example that you guys all know. And you've seen it before. But you might not have thought about it too carefully. So let's take a particle in one dimension. With the good old-fashioned commutation relation between x and p. Okay. Our old friend. So classically, the observable x times p is indistinguishable from px. However, in quantum mechanics, the corresponding quantum operators are not equal. They differ precisely by the commutator. Now, um, in this case, uh, so one might worry uh, that uh, for a given classical observable XP, uh, there are, in fact, multiple different quantum operators that you would have to define. You, you don't know whether the quantum operator corresponding to XP is X hat times P hat or P hat times X hat or some complicated linear combination thereof. But in this case, uh, there's actually uh, nothing to worry about because, in fact, only the linear combination Um, one half x hat p hat plus p hat x hat is Hermitian. So that is clearly the correct linear combination of these two quantum operators. That should be the quantum analog of the classical uh, operator, the classical observable x times p. And for example, if you wanted to uh, compute the commutator between this operator, say one half uh, xp plus px, with some other operator, some other operator, say x, then you could go ahead and compute that commutator. Let's go ahead and compute commute, compute it. Uh, well, you get an ih bar every time the x hits a p and it hits the p twice, and so you get i h bar times x. And indeed, this is equal to i h bar times the Poisson bracket of x p with x. Actually, there's a minus sign, isn't there? Thank you. Actually, why am I saying thank you? Nobody caught that minus sign. I was thanking myself. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> so in this case, um, everything uh, works just fine. The classical Poisson bracket is equal to the quantum commutator. But for more complicated, which is to say higher order in P and X operators, this is not the case. For example, if you consider the observable x squared p squared, okay, that's something that you can observe. It's the square of x times the square of the momentum. Then in quantum mechanics, the appropriate Hermitian operator, which is constructed by taking linear combinations of x squared p squared and p squared x squared, is x squared p squared plus p squared x squared. I'm sorry, I'm dropping my hats here. Um, maybe I'll try and keep my hats just to make it clear that I'm talking about quantum operators here. And one can check that the commutator of 1 half x hat squared p hat squared plus p hat squared x hat squared with another variable, say x, 
is equal to i h bar times the Poisson bracket between these two guys. plus terms of order h-bar squared, which you will compute on the problem set to next week. It's actually very easy. You just do a bunch of commutators. And then compare that to what you get from the Poisson brackets. These terms are non-zero, and they are completely uniquely determined. And in particular, they are determined by the principle that every classical operator is replaced by a corresponding Hermitian operator, which is a symmetric combination of the x's and p's, where you symmetrize over all possible orderings of the x's and p's. And that symmetrization prescription is known as Weyl's symmetrization principle. And in fact, it's presumably something that you learned in your uh, elementary quantum classes, although you might not have uh, called it such. Yes? Is there a reason why you wrote uh, your classical Poisson brackets one half of x squared p squared? Of course, um, I could have just written x squared p squared, because classical Poisson brackets don't care about the ordering of operators. I did it just to emphasize that it was the same thing. Okay. Of course, so that's equal to x squared p squared, of course. Thank you. Another question. One thing uh, that I would like to emphasize is that there's a sense in which uh, these order h bar squared terms are observable and important. Let me give you a um, slightly more uh, interesting example. So let's consider angular momentum. So the angular momentum of a particle moving in three dimensions is the cross product of the position and momentum. And so the square of the angular momentum, if you remember your identities from uh, uh, vector calculus, is just the square of that cross product, which is x squared p squared minus x dot p squared. So this is, so uh, does everyone remember how to derive that? Okay, if you don't, I'm not going to teach you, uh, uh, but it's easy enough. Um, you should all remember how to, how to derive that. Okay. And if you don't remember it, you should it's even better if you don't remember it because then you'll have to learn how to derive it. And it's much better to know how to derive something than to remember the answer. Okay. So I hope you don't remember it and have to derive it. Okay, so this is what I will call the classical square of the angular momentum uh, observable. Whereas the qu in quantum mechanics, one has to symmetrize over all of these various uh, x's and p's. So it'll be one half x squared p squared. I'm leaving off the vector symbol, of course. That's a dot product. Um, if I put vectors and hats on everything, then pretty soon there'll be so many, uh, so many things on top of the heads of these uh, of these symbols that we won't get anywhere. Um, but I'll write the vector symbols for now. So we'll have x hat squared p hat x squared p squared plus p squared x squared minus x dot p squared minus p dot x squared. Okay. So that's the symmetrized version of the quantum operator. And we could compare that to the classical operator simply by reordering all of my x's and p's using the commutation relation. And this is a straightforward exercise. You can always move your x's to the left and the p's to the right using the commutation relation. And what you'll get is that the symmetrized version of the operator is related to the uh, original classical version of the operator, which we would call J classical, 
by a shift by a constant. And that constant is, of course, got to be proportional to h bar squared, okay, just by dimensional analysis, with a factor of three halves that one can compute. It's easy enough. And um, what I'd like to emphasize is that that three halves h bar squared is observable. That is the angular momentum of the ground state of the hydrogen atom. The, this is the uh, non-vanishing expectation value of angular momentum squared uh, of the ground state of the hydrogen atom. So, for example, when you studied the hydrogen atom uh, in your uh, quantum classes, you uh, worked out the wave functions by solving Schrodinger's equation and spherical <coughs> harmonics and blah, 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 blah. <coughs> but, in fact, uh, the fact that there's a non-vanishing angular momentum of the ground state uh, or non-vanishing square of the angular momentum of the ground state has a very, very simple origin. It's coming from the fact that squares of operators need to be ordered correctly. And if you want to compare your uh, quantum operators to your classical expectations, there's always some order h bar squared shift, or there's usually some order h bar to some power shift. And in the case of angular momentum, you actually have a nice physical interpretation of that shift. It's precisely the ground state energy of the uh, hydrogen atom. I don't, do you guys actually, you guys must have, you did the hydrogen atom, I assume. But you may or may not have computed the expectation value of the square of the angular momentum in its ground state. Um, if you did, uh, then good for you. Um, how many people did that? Anyone do that? I saw someone nod. Okay. It's easy enough. You have a wave function. Angular momentum, it's, uh, you know, x cross uh, gradient. You calculate a bunch of derivatives. It's not zero. This is the answer. Okay. Good. Any questions? Yes. Um, um, no. Just not. If you put the harmonic oscillator in three dimensions and you computed the angular momentum squared of its ground state, then it, w it does work, I I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't work all the time. Question. So what exactly is the ground simulation principle? What exactly is it? Oh, sorry. Um, Weil's symmetrization principle is the statement. Well, it's actually defined on the problem set uh, uh, that you're going to do, uh, or you maybe you've started already, do next week. But it's the statement that a classical observable, which is some particular ordering of x's and p's, is replaced in quantum mechanics by the thing where you average over all possible orderings of x's and p's. So to define a quantum operator, you average over all orderings of x and p to obtain something that's completely symmetric, okay? in the sense that xp plus px is symmetric, uh, whereas xp is not. <coughs> Good question. Other questions? So this completes everything I wanted to say about quantum kinematics. You know, in the um, syllabus, I listed some discussion of Bell inequalities as, uh, as part of our, uh, our uh, treatment of quantum kinematics. I've decided to defer that discussion until we come to uh, tensor products and quantum statistical mechanics, because I think there's a much nicer treatment that I can do in that context. Um, so this completes uh, what I had planned to say about quantum kinematics. Hopefully, 80% uh, of what I said was review. Okay. Is that a correct assessment? 20% okay. new, 80% review. Okay. The remainder of this course is going to be a lot less review. Okay. Well, the remainder of this lecture is going to be review, but it's only five minutes left, so that's not so bad. Uh, any other questions? Oh, that's because my phone is vibrating in my pocket. I'm not having a seizure. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> you don't have to worry about these things. 
Uh, okay. So, we started out this course with the three basic postulates that tell us how the space of states of a system is defined in quantum mechanics. And in order to describe the time evolution of systems in quantum mechanics, we need to supplement these three postulates with a fourth. And this fourth postulate can be described in a variety of different ways. Um, the simplest way of describing this postulate is that the time evolution of a quantum state is given by Schrodinger's equation which is the statement that the time derivative of a state is given by the Hamiltonian operator acting on that state divided by I h bar. And I should emphasize that this Hamiltonian operator is the quantum operator that is obtained by quantizing the classical Hamiltonian, which is to say the classical energy of uh, energy observable in your system. But in general, this Hamiltonian uh, could depend on time. So presumably, uh, you have not studied in your lives uh, Hamiltonians which depend on time. And so a great deal of what we study uh, in the next week or so will uh, focus on the description of time-dependent Hamiltonians. But what I would like to do is describe this postulate in an alternate way, okay, which does not explicitly make reference to a Hamiltonian, and I think is uh, maybe a bit uh, 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 more um, elegant as far as thinking about the structure of quantum mechanics. And so instead, I prefer to think about this force postulate as uh, a postulate concerning unitary time evolution operators. Okay. So another way of phrasing this is to denote by psi comma t the state at time t and then the time evolution of the state is given by a unitary transformation that is to say if you start by describing the state at some time t prime then the state at some time t will be given by some unitary operator acting on the state at time t prime, where this u is a unitary operator, unitary operator called uh, the time evolution operator. And uh, the assumption uh, of uh, so the postulate of Schrodinger's equation in terms of time derivatives of the state being given by the Hamiltonian acting on the state can then be replaced by certain postulates about the properties of this general time evolution operator. So um, the first postulate is that, as I said, U is unitary. Um, and we wish u to be unitary uh, so that probability is conserved, okay? So, or in other words, so that psi of t remains unit normalized And then this other postulate will be supplemented by further postulates, uh, which we will start discussing next class. Okay, because uh, I'm now out of time. But before uh, I end, maybe I should pause and see if there are any questions. Okay. 
I assume that you guys have all seen the expression, seen the unitary time evolution operator before. Can't you probably call it e to the i h t over h bar? That's wrong, but that's probably what you called it. Um, okay. If there are no questions, I'll stop here and see you guys on Friday.